Today we'll talk about section 11.1 .1 on simple interest. There are several terms that we will regularly use. Interest is the amount of money paid by a financial institution on a certain amount of money deposited. It's also used to describe the amount of money that's paid to a financial institution in order to borrow a certain amount of money. Principal or present value is the amount deposited or borrowed. And future value is the amount of money that will be in the account after T years. In other words, the future value of the money. There are two types of interest received from accounts of deposit with financial institutions or incurred when taking out consumer loans. If the amount of interest is based only on the amount of money borrowed or deposited for a fixed period of time and is not affected by periodic payments made toward the amount owed or borrowed, then the interest is called simple interest. Take a ridiculous example where you had 50% interest payments, simple interest payments. If you start out with $100, after year one, 50% of 100 is 50, you'd get a $50 payment. After year two, you'd get a $50 payment. And after year three, you get a $50 payment. The simple interest idea is that the principal stays the same and you get a certain amount off of that each year. That's simple interest. A good way to think about this is with a simple interest account, the interest that you receive on the principal does not earn any interest itself. The principal, in this case $100, earns interest, but the interest payments themselves, the $50, never earn any interest. The second type, called compound interest, is something we'll talk about in the next section. Let's focus on simple interest. The formula for calculating the amount of simple interest is given by capital I is equal to capital PRT. Capital I is the amount of interest earned or paid. Capital P is the principal or present value. Little r is the interest rate written as a decimal. And sometimes little r is called APR, which stands for annual percentage rate. And little t is the time in years. It has to be in years. For example, $500 is deposited in an account paying 6% simple interest. How much interest will the deposit earn in four years? You simply plug into the formula. The principal is $500. That's how much you deposited. The interest rate is 6%. Written as a decimal, you move the decimal two places to the left. That gives you 0.06. And you're doing it for four years, so t is equal to 4. And if you multiply those three numbers together, 500 times 0 0.06 times 4 equal, you get 120. So you'd make $120 in interest if you put $500 in for 6% interest for a period of four years. And if the interest were simple interest. Sometimes you don't want to know just the amount of interest you earn. Sometimes you'll actually want to know how much money's in the account after four years or however many years. And to do that, we just take the interest, which was $120, the amount of interest, and add it back to the principal, which is $500. So the, the principal plus interest gives you the amount of interest in the account, which is $620. That $620, the total amount in the account after a certain period of time is called the future value. And as always, when you're doing these calculations, your final step should always be trying to see if your answer at least seems fairly reasonable. So if you take $500, put it away for four years at a pretty good interest rate, does it seem somewhat reasonable that you might end up with 620? And I would say yes. If the answer had come out to be 6200, I would say no, that's probably a mistake. That sounds wild. So always think about that when you do a calculation to see if your answer even seems reasonable. If it doesn't, you can probably find your error and fix it. Another example. If you withdraw part of your money from a certificate of deposit before the date of maturity, you must pay an interest penalty. Suppose you invested $7,000 in a one-year certificate of deposit paying 8.5% interest. After six months, you decide to withdraw $7,000. Your interest penalty is three months simple interest on the $7,000. What interest penalty do you pay? And round your answer to two decimal places. Now that problem is very wordy, but if you just read one of those very last sentences, that's really all you 
really need to know to do the calculation. It says your interest penalty is three months simple interest on the $7,000. So all you need to do is take your interest formula, capital I is equal to capital PRT, and figure out what the amount of interest would be on that. So $7,000 principal at 8.5% would be 0 0.085 for R, and you, your time always has been in years, so three months is three-twelfths of a year. Notice that three-twelfths, if you take your calculator out, is just 0.25, and if you multiply those three numbers together, you'll end up with $148.75. That would be the penalty you would have to pay for withdrawing that $7,000 early by three months. Now just to summarize, I put the formula back up here again. The formula for calculating the amount of simple interest is capital I equals capital PRT, where I, P, R, and T are as defined earlier. That's the amount of interest. If I want to know how much is actually in the account, I'm going to call that capital A. The future value is capital A. It's simply the principal plus the interest. We've already talked about that. But notice that I, capital I, is really PRT. So if I took that capital I out and substituted PRT, I have a capital P in both terms. I could actually factor a P out and get P times the sum of 1 plus RT. That's really the easiest way to write this. So if I get out the clutter in the middle, I get a formula for future value for simple interest. And it's capital A is equal to capital P times the sum of 1 plus RT. That formula will take you directly to the amount in the account without calculating the amount of interest first. You can always calculate the amount of interest first and then add it back to the principal, but if you're only interested in how much is in the account, this is a little faster. That capital A again is called the future value for a simple interest investment. So going back to that previous example, before I wanted to know how much interest would be earned after four years, suppose this time I just want to find the future value of the investment in four years. That means I want the capital A. I can use this formula. I know that I can get it by taking P plus capital I and getting 620 because I did it a minute ago. But what if I want to go directly for the amount without actually calculating capital I first? All I would have to do is plug 500 in for capital P 6%, which is 0 0.06 in for R, and T is equal to 4, and do the calculation. 4 times 0 0.06 is 0 0.24, 0 0.24 plus 1 is 1.24, and 1.24 times 500 is 620. It's the same answer I got earlier. You can do it either way. This formula is actually faster if all you want is the amount in the account, but you can certainly calculate it the other way as well. We'll say one other thing. This formula can also be used to calculate the total payback on a simple interest loan from some financial institution if you borrow money with simple interest. In this case, capital A is called the maturity value of the loan, and it represents the entire amount paid back or to be paid back, which includes both the principal and the interest. So capital A can be the future value for a simple interest investment. Capital A can be the maturity value for a simple interest loan. The same formula is playing double duty. How about this? Find the maturity value of an eighth month simple interest loan of $8,000 if the interest rate is 9.75%. Again, I want the maturity value, so I use the formula A is equal to P times the sum of 1 plus RT, and I plug in all the values. The principal is 8,000. The interest rate is 9.75%. If you move the decimal two places to the left, you get 0.0975 and you're doing it for eight months, but the answer has to be in years, so you get eight twelfths of a year. Eight twelfths is about 0.666667. If you multiply that by 0 0.0975 and add one to it, you get 1.065, and if you multiply that by 8,000, you get about $8,520. So the maturity value of an eighth month simple interest loan of $8,000 at an interest rate of 9.75% is $8,520. And this one. Your electric bill is $124. You are charged 8% simple interest for late payments. How much do you owe if you pay the bill five months past the due date 
and round your answer to two decimal places. Again, same formula. The principal is the amount of the bill, that's $124. The interest rate is 8%, that's 0 .08. You're doing it five months late, so that's five twelfths of a year. Five twelfths is about 0.416667. Multiply by 0 .08 and add one, and you get 1.033333, and you multiply that by 124, and you end up with $128.13. I know I say this a lot, but don't round too much in the preliminary calculations. Carry more decimal places than you think you need, and then round at the end. Rounding too early can cause you to be off in the final answer. In reality, simple interest is not frequently used in average consumer transactions, but when it is, it's often used for just short periods of time. For example, let's calculate the simple interest due on a three-month loan of $2,000 if the interest rate is 6.5%. It's a three-month loan and the time has to be in years, so as before, we have to change that to years, months to years. Three months is three-twelfths of a year, three-twelfths is one-fourth, so T is equal to one-fourth. You have to go from months to years for the formula to work. So the capital I equals capital PRT will give you the um, interest due. We're looking for the interest due this time. 2,000 is the principal, 6.5%, which is 0 .065 is the interest rate, and the years is one-fourth of a year. Three months is one-fourth of a year. One-fourth is 0 .25, and if you multiply those three numbers together, you get $32.50. So the interest due on a three-month loan of $2,000 at 6.5% simple interest is $32.50. I can't emphasize enough the T has to be in years. So when you're given months, you have to divide by 12 to get the number of years. How about this? Let's calculate the simple interest due on a 90-day loan of $2,000 if the interest rate is 6.5%. This is a little different. We've been doing years and months. This is a 90-day loan. So you still have to change it to years, but you gotta think a minute. There are 365 days in a year, so 90 days is 90 365ths of a year. And if you do that on the calculator, that comes out to be about 0.246575. Again, take plenty of extra decimal places. You have to convert it back to years. And if you're doing days, divide by 365. Same formula, the principal is 2000, the interest rate is 0 0.065, which is 6.5% written as a decimal, and the time is 0.246575, and if you multiply those three numbers together, you get $32.05. So if you take out a 90-day simple interest loan at 6.5% where you've borrowed $2,000, you will owe $3,205. Dividing by 365 is called the exact method. I'll show you why with the next example. Not all months have the same number of days. You probably know that. So some institutions just simplify their calculations by pretending that every month has 30 days. But 30 times 12 is only 360. So if they do that, they're working with a 360-day year instead of a 365-day year just for the purposes of interest calculations. This is called the ordinary method. So if you go back to the previous problem, the exact method uses the exact number of days in the year, which is 365. The ordinary method pretends there's only 360 days in a year and uses 360 instead of 365. So the calculation is exactly the same if we want to do it by the ordinary method instead of the exact method. So if I take that exact same problem, but this time doing it using the ordinary method, the only difference is converting to 90 days, I divide by 360 instead of 365. So ordinary method, divide by 360, exact method, divide by 365. I'm doing the ordinary method here, so I want to divide by 360. So 90 divided by 360 actually comes out to be 0.25. Otherwise, the calculation is exactly the same. 
P is 2,000, R is 0 0.065, and now T is 0 0.25. If you multiply those three numbers together, you get $32.50. So now you owe the bank $32.50 if you're calculating using the ordinary method. It turns out that most financial institutions actually do use the ordinary method when dealing with days. So if you have a problem where you're doing days, unless it says differently, assume that you're going to be using the ordinary method and dividing by 360, unless it tells you to do otherwise. And as a side note, the ordinary method is actually more favorable to the lender. How about this one? Calculate the simple interest rate if P is equal to 2400, I is equal to 44, and T is equal to four months. We're looking for the interest rate. So we use the formula capital I is equal to capital PRT, but this time we're solving for little r. So we know that the amount of interest is $44, that's capital I. The principal or present value is $2,400, and it's four months, that's four twelfths of a year for T. And of course, four twelfths is one third, and one third times 2,400 is 800. So you get 44 is equal to 800 R, and if you divide both sides by 800, you end up with R is equal to 0 0.055, and if you change that to a percent, you get five and a half percent. So, here are the formulas you will need to do your homework. Section 11.2 on compound interest. Recall that in discussing simple interest in the previous section, we defined some terms like interest, principal or present value, and future value. Now, in the discussion of compound interest, which is today's topic, the future value is also sometimes called the compound amount. So principal and present value are interchangeable terminology, and in the context of what we'll talk about today, which is compound interest, future value and compound amount are equivalent terms. Remember, we talked about simple interest last time, and just as a way of summarizing it, simple interest doesn't pay interest on the interest earned. Compound interest, unlike simple interest, the interest is factored in. In other words, interest paid is added to the initial deposit and the interest begins to earn interest. Or similarly, if you're talking about a loan, the interest owed is added back into the total amount owed and begins to incur an interest charge of its own. So that contrasts with simple interest where the interest itself never collects interest. So compound interest, the interest itself either receives interest if you're saving money for compound interest, this is kind of an extreme example. I did an example with 50% interest rate for simple interest, but let me take that same example, and it is extreme. Nobody's going to give you a 50% interest rate, but it illustrates the point. We have a simple interest with 50%. I did that last time. I want to take that same $100 principal, same 50% interest, but this time I'm going to let it compound at 50%. Compound interest versus simple interest. You can see what happens. In the first year, if you put in $100 and left it for a year, at 50% interest, you would earn $50 at the end of the first year. At the end of the second year, you'd earn another $50, and at the end of the third year, that $100 would earn yet another $50. So far, it's just like simple interest, but here's where it differs. The interest that you earned in the first year, in this case $50, in the second year earns its own 50% interest, which means it earns $25. And then in the third year, it earns another $25. And then if you move to the second year, that $25 that you earned in interest also earns interest for the third year, and 50% of 25 is $12.50, so that $25 would earn $12.50 interest. So you can see every amount of interest starts earning its own interest, and that's what compound interest is. And that graph gives you what's called the interest trajectory. Most interest-bearing accounts pay compound interest rather than simple interest. There are cases where simple interest comes into play. In terms of common consumer transactions, you will almost always be dealing with compound interest, where the interest itself earns interest or charges you interest if you're talking about a loan. To calculate the amount of interest earned in a compound interest account, we have to know how many times during the year that the interest is paid back and added to the account. That quantity is called the compounding period. Here are the common compounding periods. 
If you compound once a year, that's called annual compound interest. If you compound twice a year, that's called semi-annual. If you compound four times a year, that's called quarterly. Monthly is 12 times a year. Weekly is 52 times a year. And assuming you're using the ordinary method, daily is 360 times a year. Remember in the last discussion, we talked about using the ordinary method most of the time when we talk about daily interest rate. I won't derive the formula for compound interest, but I will give it to you. This is it. The formula for the accumulated value, or sometimes we call that the future value, of compound interest is given by the formula capital A is equal to capital P times the quantity, which is the sum of 1 plus R divided by N raised to the power of NT. That capital A is called the future value, or as I said earlier, sometimes it's called the compound amount, and Sometimes I call it the accumulated value to sort of make sense of the capital A. So if you hear future value or compound amount, we're talking about the capital A. Capital P is the principal or present value, just like it was with simple interest. Little r is the annual interest rate or APR, just as it was with simple interest. Little n is the number of compounding periods per year. This only comes into play for compound interest. There is no compounding with simple interest, so this is a new variable. And little t is the time in years, just as it was for simple interest. So basically, we only have one new variable, and that's little n, which is the number of compounding periods per year. We have one new variable, and we have the new formula. For example, $2,000 is deposited in an account paying 4% annual interest compounded quarterly. How much money will be in the account after three years? Using the formula, principal is the amount you started with. You put in $2,000, so the principal is $2,000. The annual interest rate is 4%, that's 0 .04 as a decimal is compounded quarterly, which means four times a year, so n is equal to four. And you notice I'm just plugging these numbers in, and we're doing it for three years, so for t, you plug in three. Now it's an arithmetic problem. There are any, any number of ways to do this with your calculator. I'm going to try a standard way and sort of stick to it. When I do these problems like this, I tend to go ahead and multiply the exponent there. So in this case, I would go ahead and multiply the 4 times 3 and get 12. Once you get to that point, it's very easy just to enter the whole thing into your calculator, and I'll show you how. It involves the parentheses key. You've got the left and right parens that sit about midway of your calculator buttons. How do you use it? Well, I would suggest that you actually write out what you're going to type in before you even start to minimize the mistakes, and I think I can explain to you why that might be helpful. If you look at this problem, these are the keystrokes, and if you write them out before you even start typing them in, you're less likely to make mistakes. So if, for instance, the first thing I'm going to do is, is enter 2000. That's the principle. Now, if you look at the formula, there's no multiplication symbol. There's an implied multiplication. When you put a number next to parentheses in our normal writing of things, that's an implied multiplication. If you go ahead and write down times before you start typing it in, you're less likely to forget to press the multiplication key. If you don't press that multiplication key, you're not going to get the right answer. So even though there's no multiplication symbol in the original formula, when you write a number next to a left paren, that's implied multiplication. So it might be a good idea to actually write that out. And then you see the left paren, so you press the left paren button on your calculator, then you type in 1, then you type in plus, then you type in 0 .04, then you hit the division key, then you type in 4, then you type the right paren. Now here's another place you might forget if you're not careful. That 12 is an exponent, so you have to press the exponentiation key on your calculator, or the power key, and that is the X to the Y button, and if you look on your calculator, it's one of those buttons above the red uh, clear and all clear buttons in your calculator. Press that power key. 
That tells the calculator that you're about to type in an exponent. Once you press the power key, now you can enter 12, and then to make the evaluation of the, of the uh, expression complete, you press equal. And if you do all of those things, you will end up with $2,253.65006, and if you round that off to the nearest cents, that will be 65 cents. So it would be $2,253.65 rounded to the nearest cent. If you put $2,000 in an account paying 4% annual interest compounded quarterly, at the end of three years, you will have $2,253.65 in that account. Final step in all these problems is to think about, does that answer seem reasonable? You start out with $2,000, three years later you've got about $2,250. Nothing flashes in my mind as being obviously wrong with that, so I think that's probably okay. If you get something like $20,000, you know that, that something's wrong with that, and you can go back and find your mistake. Let's try another. How much interest is earned in nine years on $8,300 deposited in an account paying 8% interest compounded semi-annually, and then we'll round the answer off to two decimal places. Be careful here, though, because what you're being asked for is the interest earned and not the future value. The formula that I just gave you to calculate for compound interest is for A. A is the future value and we only want the interest. But remember, the future value is just the total amount in the account. So if you want the interest, you can still use the formula for capital A, but before you give your final answer, you just have to subtract off the principal and that'll leave you with just the interest earned. So. Don't get so involved in doing the calculation that you forget that the question actually only asks for the interest. So, you start off with the same formula. The principal is $8,300. The interest rate is 8%, which is 0 0.08. It's compounded semi-annually. That's twice a year, so N is 2. And it's for 9 years, so T is 9. Plug into the formula. And if you use my technique, you'll go ahead and do 2 times 9 and get 18, and then go to your calculator. I can type that entire expression in my calculator now in one swoop. I'll type in the 8300. That's an implied multiplication, so I have to hit multiplication. Then I do left paren, then I type in a 1, then I type in a plus, then I type in 0 .08, followed by the division symbol followed by 2, hit the right paren to close the parentheses, the 18 is in the power, so I have to hit the x to the y, which is the power key. That tells the calculator that I'm about to type in a power. Now I can type in 18, and when I press equal to, the display should show $16,814.28 rounded to the nearest cent. And again, the last step is to see if it's reasonable. You start off with 8300 and you end up with 16000 something, that seems a little high until you think about the fact that you left it in there for nine years and you were getting an 8% rate, which is pretty good. So I can see that happening and I don't question it. Now, if you got 160000 you'd say that's definitely a, a red flag and I probably did something wrong. I always think about that when you finish a calculation. And again, we weren't asked for A. A is the amount in the account. The problem asks for the interest, so all you got to do is figure that you took $8,300 and turned it into $16,814.28, so the amount of interest you earned is actually the difference between those two numbers. So had they asked for the amount in the account or the future value, the answer would have been $16,814.28, but because they only asked for the interest earned, you have to subtract off the principal, so the answer would be $8,514.28. Another. In 2017, John's salary is $50,000. If the inflation rate is 2.5% annually over the next five years, what would John's salary be to have the same purchasing power in 2022? Now, on the surface of it, this looks nothing like taking money and putting it into a savings account, but in fact, a salary subjected to an inflation rate is exactly like putting money in a bank 
and seeing what it's worth later. So although it's not worded in terms of that, anytime you see a salary with an inflation rate calculation, it's going to be the same thing. So we use the same formula and we notice that the rate is annually, so that means we're compounding once per year, so n is 1. The interest rate is 2.5 percent, so that's going to be 0 0.025 when you change it to a decimal. The principal is the starting salary, which is $50,000. We're doing it, we're looking over a course of five years, so t is 5. And of course, 1 times 5 in the exponent is just 5. And at this point, I would go to the calculator, as I've been doing in the other problems, and type in the keystrokes, 50,000 times, left paren, 1 plus 0.025, right paren, power button, 5 equal, and you get, rounded to the nearest cent, $56,570.41 rounded to the nearest cent. The same thing as we're doing if you're actually putting money in a, an account and taking it out later. You can always treat these salary problems given an inflation rate as if it were just putting money in a bank. And finally, does it seem reasonable? I think so. You had a $50,000 salary. You got a fairly low inflation rate, 2.5%, five years. Not unreasonable that you'd end up with about a $56,000 salary. I don't see any reason to question that. Now, I told you earlier that the new variable in this formula for compound interest is n, and the question might arise in your mind is, why does n even matter? And the answer is, when we compound more often, in other words, n gets larger, annually, semi-annually, quarterly, and so on, the account earns more interest. So that's why it matters. The effective annual rate of an investment is the actual interest rate earned for a single year that accounts for the compounding by converting the rate to the simple interest rate that would produce the same future value. So if you want to compare a quarterly rate to a daily rate or an annual rate to a quarterly rate, it's hard to compare apples to oranges. So if you can change everything back to a common base, you can fairly compare them. So the idea of the effective annual rate is that you're taking all these quarterlies and annuals and dailies and you're changing them back to, to the rate they would be equal to if they were all just simple interest. Let's see how that works. A bank offers a savings account paying 6% annual interest compounded monthly. What is the effective annual rate rounded to the nearest hundredth of a percent? The first thing you want to do is use the compound interest formula to find out what capital A is. In other words, how much will that uh, money that you put in the beginning be worth at the end? The interest rate is going to be the same no matter how much you deposit it. So what I usually do is just pretend I put in a dollar and I'm doing it for one year. So when you're doing these effective annual rates, it does, the, the actual amount doesn't matter. The rate's going to come out the same either way. Just pretend you're investing a dollar for a year. And if you do that, we know the interest rate was 6%, so that's going to be 0.06. And we know we're doing it monthly, which means n is equal to 12. If you plug all those numbers in there, including the assumption that we're only investing a dollar for a year, you get that expression. And of course, I always take the multiplication of the exponents and get that out of the way. So that turns out just to be 12. And while I was there, I went ahead and divided 0 0.06 divided by 12. But you really could go ahead and build that into your calculation. You need to play around with this calculator and get comfortable with the way that makes most sense to you. There's no one way that's always better than every other way. But you need to practice and get your comfort level. So this time I decided not only to multiply the exponents, but I decided to divide the 0 0.06 divided by 12. I didn't have to do that first, but I did. And if you take the 0 0.05 and add to 1, you get 1.05. And so all you're doing is taking 1.005 and raising it to the 12th power. And if you do that using the power key, you get about 1.0616778. So I did that whole problem without trying to type the whole thing in. But you could have done it that way. In fact, it'd be a good idea to try just doing it by typing in the whole equation with left and right hand parens 
or the whole expression with left and right hand parens and see if you don't get the same thing. Anyway, a dollar after a year under those conditions would turn out to be a little over a dollar and six cents. That's step one. Step two is to take the simple interest formula. So we're trying to change it and see what it would be if it were just simple interest. So take the amount earned and plug it into the simple interest formula. So I'll take that A value of 1.0616778 and let it be the A in the simple interest formula. I'm still investing a dollar for a year, so uh, P is a dollar and T is a year. And if I do that calculation, I end up with 1.0616778 equals 1 plus R. And if I subtract R from both sides, I end up with 0.0616778. Now, that means it's equivalent to a 6.16778%, which rounded to hundredths place, which is what the problem said to do, would be about 6.17%. In other words, if I advertise a rate of 6% compounded monthly, that would be the same thing as a 6.17 rate if it were simple interest. Now, I know that looks like a lot of work, but I'm going to show you a shortcut. If you'll look at this, in that step two, you got, a, a, you got to a stage where you had 0.0616778. If you look back at the end result of step one, that 0.0616778 showed up, but it was one point that. That was not a coincidence. So what I'm telling you is, if you follow through the whole thing, it's kind of logical and you get that you end up with that 6.17%. But in reality, once you get the, to the end of step one and you have that 1.0616778, that's going to be your answer without even doing step two. That wasn't a coincidence that those numbers matched up. So you really don't have to do step two at all if you'll just notice that. Once you get to the end of step one, all you got to do is ignore the one and what's left over will be the answer. Of course, you still want to change it to a percent and round it off, but it saves you from having to do all of step two. It makes the calculation of the effective annual rate much simpler if you notice that result. Some problems might actually ask us to solve for capital P, the present value, instead of capital A, which is the future value. For those problems, it might be easier to solve the above formula for P and use it instead. So if you take that formula that we learned at the beginning of the section, capital A is equal to P times that quantity raised to a power, if you're actually solving for capital P, you could just plug the numbers in directly into that formula and solve for P later. But one thing you could do is divide both sides by that expression raised to a power and solve for P directly. And then plug in numbers. So for example, if I told you that the capital A was 15000 that the interest rate was 7% compounded monthly, and we were leaving the money in the bank for five years, you could calculate the present value, which is the capital P, by using that bottom formula. You could also calculate it using the top formula. The bottom formula is already solved for P, is the only advantage to using that formula over the top formula. They're the same formula written in two different ways. One is solved for A, one is solved for P. But if you use the bottom formula, you're going to plug in 15,000 for A, 0 0.07 for R, 12 for N, and T is equal to 5. And if you take my advice and multiply the 12 times the 5 together to get 60, at this stage, you really can take that entire thing and type it into the calculator all at once. And there are your keystrokes. You type in 15,000, the fraction bar is a division symbol, then you hit the left paren and do 1 plus, then you type in 0.07, and then the slash is another division, so you hit div divided by 12, then you want to close the right paren. That 60 is in the exponent position, so you have to press the power button, the x to the y, then you type in 60, and if you press equal to, it will do the entire calculation. And before rounding, you get a present value of $10,581.07557. And if you round that to the nearest cent, you get a present value of $10,581.08. And again, that seems reasonable that if you took about $10,500 and left it in the bank for five years at a pretty decent interest rate, 
you could end up with 15,000. So it doesn't seem unreasonable. So I will accept that answer. I have no reason to question it. Let's try another. How much money should be invested in an account that earns 3% interest compounded monthly in order to have $11,000 in five years? And then round your answer to two decimal places. Again, since we're looking for the present value, it probably makes sense to use the version of the formula that's already solved for capital P. But as I said before, you can still use the top formula. It just requires a division at the end if you do it that way. But I'll use the second formula. $11,000 is the future value. In other words, you want to have $11,000 in five years later. That $11,000 is a future value. That's what capital A is. The interest is 3%, which is 0.03. It's compounded monthly, so n is 12, and you're doing it for five years, so t is equal to five. Again, if you take, go ahead and take care of the exponent, do 12 times five is 60, you can type the rest of it in. 11,000, the, the big fraction bar is a division, then you've got a left paren, one plus 0.03, and the slash is another division, divided by 12, then you close the right paren, then you hit the power key because the 60 is an exponent, then you type in 60, and you hit equal to, and you end up with a present value of $9,469.560164. And if you round it to two decimal places, you end up with $9,469.56 to the nearest cent. And again, it seems fairly reasonable that you start off with a little less than $9,500. And five years later, you end up with $11,000. That doesn't seem to raise any red flags in my mind. So I'll accept that answer. And again, I said this before, but those two formulas for capital A equal to and capital P equal to, those are really the same formula. The top version, is, it's solved for A. The bottom version, it's solved for P. But those are the same two formulas. Those aren't really two different formulas.